afternoon in, in America and good evening in Europe. Salute for Asia, Africa, and Oceania. And this is the, the session uh, number six of the this, uh, Congress of the World Day of the Critical Lung. We have a panel of three experts of, of these issues. Uh, we begin with the Dr. Barreiro. Dr. Barreiro is for Spain, Esther Barreiro. She's a specialist in respiratory disease. And she has a, a special presentation for this, uh, this afternoon with the theme uh, bronchoobstructive disease is the theme of this session. And the issue of the Dr. Barreiro is COPD, a challenge and maintenance of muscle mass and function in critical aid patients. Dr. Barreiro, you are there, no? Yes, I'm here. Thank okay. you. Very you have 15 minutes. So that's uh, the title of my present presentation is COPD, a challenge in maintenance of muscle mass function in critically ill patients. I'm going to talk about skeletal muscles. I'm not going to talk about lungs, although this is the critical lung day because uh, I was assigned to talk about this and uh, how this muscle weakness in patients with uh, COPD who are also uh, critically ill may uh, maybe uh, may get worse in this type of patients. Well, I have, first of all, I'd like to say that I have no re special relationships to disclose regarding this presentation. And first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, what chronic obstructive pulmonary disease means and its relationships with skeletal muscle dysfunction and also mass loss, and how all these features have a prognostic value. Uh, this is a very nice, uh, interesting article that was published many years ago, but still it's quite uh, a live paper because it's a seminal paper in which these authors from Brussels, from Belgium, sorry, they uh, clearly demonstrated that uh, in both groups of uh, muscles, respiratory muscles and limb muscles, there was a significant decline in the production of uh, force by these muscles in patients with COPD compared to the healthy controls uh, shown here in the white bars. And when these patients have um, a loss of muscle mass, such as, for example, the patient uh, being shown in this picture, so this uh, actually what happens is that there is a significant uh, a part of the reduction in the force being produced by these patients. This is a study that was published also a few years ago, and the authors tried to demonstrate the prevalence of uh, COPD muscle dysfunction in this type of patients, and actually they could demonstrate that approximately one third of the patients, even those patients who have a very early uh, COPD, uh, where uh, they already developed a significant uh, reduction in muscle force being produced by the quadriceps muscle, in this case by the lower limb muscles. In the same study, the, the, same, the same authors, they also demonstrated that quadriceps weakness uh, which means that there was a significant reduction in the strength being produced by this muscle, exists even in the absence of severe airflow obstruction. As shown here, these are gold stage one and two patients who are actually very mild or very moderate, who have very mild or very moderate uh, COPD. And uh, here also, they also demonstrated that both score, which is a uh, a score for uh, prognosis, which has prognosis value, they clearly showed that patients with, in the early stages of this both score, approximately one third of the patients already had quadriceps muscle weakness. Uh, quadriceps muscle weakness has also been shown in several studies. These are just two seminal papers that were also published a few years ago. So this uh, quadriceps muscle weakness is a factor that may predict mortality, as can be shown here. For the same degree of the airway obstruction in the patients, patients who had quadriceps muscle weakness died earlier than those patients who didn't have the quadriceps muscle weakness. And this, uh, in the, in the right-hand side of the slide, we can see that patients for the same degree of the airway obstruction, those patients who had quadriceps muscle weakness and also had smaller muscles as measured by the MTCSA, which is the cross-sectional of the mid-thigh, uh, also were those patients who died significantly earlier compared to patients who didn't have this muscle weakness. This is another study published by the group in the Netherlands, and they also showed that those patients who had cachexia, which means that were really uh, very uh, muscle depleted, were the patients who died significantly earlier compared to the patients who didn't have this muscle, uh, muscle mass loss or muscle weakness. 
And this is also another study that was published again a few years ago in COPD, where they also, the, uh, these authors demonstrated that the patients who had a fiber type shift, which means that they have a switch from uh, resistance, from fibers who are more resistant to fatigue, to uh, fibers who are less resistant to fatigue, were also those patients who died significantly earlier compared to patients who didn't have this fiber shift. So we are facing a huge problem in, uh, just in the context of patients who may uh, not, stable COPD patients who have muscle weakness and all these problems, nutritional depletion, because they die significantly earlier for the same degree of airway obstruction compared to patients who don't have these problems. So if we uh, are now we switch uh, topic, uh, we move from COPD to ICU, uh, ICU acquire muscle weakness. So we also know that this is a, a huge problem. You are all, uh, all aware of this problem because you are uh, like the intensivists. And the definitions that uh, this is just a definition, we can just uh, skip this very quickly, but I'd like to focus on the different types of uh, muscle weakness in patients, uh, critically ill patients, such as the axonal polyneuropathy and the myopathy. Myopathy is probably the most important one because patients start losing muscle and uh, what happens in the ICU settings is that most of the patients have a combination of both uh, neuro what is called as neuromyopathy. And this may persist uh, for months and even years after hospitalization and the muscle wasting and weakness is very frequent in these type of patients. The diagnosis is based on clinical criteria uh, also, in el is also based on electrophysiological characteristics, and also it may also be based on histologic features. This is very difficult because then you need a muscle biopsy, and of course, in critically illness, it's not always possible to have this type of uh, approaches. But it's possible to study the histologic features of these patients, and the prevalence is said to be uh, to range between uh, 25 to 100 percent in all critically ill patients, especially after several days of being in the ICU. This is just an example of a patient who is actually uh, starting rehab very, very, very early on because it's important to move these muscles at the very, the very early stages in order to prevent uh, the remaining muscle weakness that, may, uh, that these patients may suffer after uh, hospital discharge. And this is a study that I really like it very much because it was published also a few years ago by the group in, uh, in uh, Toronto. And what they showed that is even after five years, these patients had been discharged five years earlier, the median six minute walk distance was actually around between 76% uh, of predicted distance. This means that the patients had uh, like uh, very poor outcomes even after five years of being discharged from the ICU. So this means that the problems that they, this, the patients experience with their muscles remain uh, uh, even uh, after five years of being uh, out of the hospital. This is just a scale that is uh, probably used by all of you in the ICU settings, just to uh, evaluate actually to assess uh, the different um, the muscle strength and the different movements that the patient is able to uh, to to do, to conduct, and it's possible through this scale to uh, categorize the patients and to uh, have a score uh, which gives us an idea of uh, the severity of this muscle weakness. The most common risk factors for muscle weakness are the severity and duration of the systemic inflammatory response, uh, the length of the ICU stay, that is very important, that's probably one of the crucial factors, the duration of the mechanical ventilation, and in the case of COPD patients, of course, this is uh, uh, this may even uh, I mean um, deteriorate uh, and um, the lung function of the patients because of the COPD and the underlying COPD, which may actually um, uh, lead to a longer duration of the mechanical ventilation, hyperglycemia, also the lack of uh, albumin or proteins, parental nutrition, the use of corticosteroids especially systemic corticosteroids, and of course the use of neuromuscular blocking agents. The presence and severity of the ICU acquired weakness are all of them independent risk factors for death in the patients regardless of the underlying disease that uh, sent the patient to the ICU. The, there are several uh, like uh, guidelines, the, I mean the journals, respiratory and critical care journals are very concerned about this problem 
And of course, there are several guidelines and several statement documents that are very important. And for me, what I have uh, realized in the, in the last few days when preparing this presentation is that the influence of COPD and even other chronic respiratory conditions actually is not, is, is not still there. And I think that more studies are needed in order to uh, determine the, uh, the, I mean, the strength of the COPD itself in uh, the evolution and the progression of the ICU acquired weakness in this type of in the critical ill patients. Biological mechanisms. I'd like just to give you just a very short overview of uh, about the different um, biological mechanisms that are involved in this uh, uh, process of muscle weakness and muscle mass loss in critical illness. We have to bear in mind that muscle mass maintenance is a balance between protein synthesis and degradation. This happens in our body every day on a regular basis, and this is the normal process. And when there is an increase in protein degradation, then what happens is that we are losing, we start losing muscles, and our muscles become weaker and weaker, progressively weaker. This is an example. This, is, this was a paper published also by the group in, uh, in Toronto, where they nicely showed the different mechanisms, uh, different targets that can be uh, deteriorated, that can be impaired as a result of this process of uh, ICU muscle weakness. This is also a seminal study published uh, by uh, a group in England, uh, where they showed that there was a significant reduction, that's important, uh, a significant reduction in the cross-sectional area of both uh, slow twitch and uh, fast twitch fibers of skeletal muscles in patients, uh, in, in patients who were hospitalized in the ICU. And especially this myopathy, they, uh, these authors claim that it was specific for uh, the slow twitch fibers. This is another study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, also by the group in, in Pennsylvania. And they also showed that uh, uh, the diaphragm also become atrophied uh, very quickly when it's uh, very mechanically ventilated, and especially in patients with underlying COPD. They clearly showed that there was also a significant reduction in the size of both the slow and fast twitch uh, muscle fibers, in, the, in, in this case, in the diaphragm, the respiratory muscle. They also measured uh, different uh, mechanisms, and actually they concluded that ubiquitin proteasome pathway, which is a major pathway uh, involved in protein degradation, and apoptosis also were significantly increased in the diaphragm of these uh, critically ill patients compared to the controls. This is another study uh, conducted by a group in England where they analyzed the rectus femoris, which is a different, uh, a different muscle. And also again, they showed that there was a significant decline in the size of these of the muscle fibers of this uh, muscle. And they also measured uh, differ different mechanisms of epigenetic regulation of muscle mass maintenance. And as you can see here, the were significantly altered. I'm not going uh, through all the details because we don't have uh, time. But uh, just to show you that the patients had alterations compared to the controls that were used in uh, this case, in this study, for the rectus femoris. This is again another study conducted uh, in, by a group in the Netherlands. Uh, and again, they focused on the diaphragm uh, from patients with COPD that were critically ill. And they also demonstrated again that there was a significant decline in the sizes of both slow twitch and fast twitch muscle fibers of the diaphragm in the critically critically ill patients compared to the healthy controls. And this is a very nice uh, picture because they also analyze the sarcomere disruptions in the diaphragm, taking place in the diaphragm of these patients, of the critically ill patients with COPD compared to the healthy controls. And they found that the structure of the sarcomeres were disrupted in these critically ill patients compared to the healthy controls. The same uh, group, also in the same study, they also uh, focused on the analysis of protein degradation and they measured the levels of ubiquitin proteasome pathway. And again, they found a significant I increase in uh, this protein degradation marker in the critically ill patients in the diaphragm of the critically ill patients compared to the healthy controls. This is another study, again, conducted by the group in, uh, in, in Canada. And this is just to briefly summarize that uh, what they showed here, they didn't have patients with COPD. But the summary of this study was that what they found in the quadriceps muscle of the critically ill patients, a significant decline in the strength and also in the sizes of the muscle fibers, uh, even as seven days after being um, discharged from the ICU. Weakness persisted uh, up to six months. Muscle atrophy resolved only in one third of the patients after six months. 
and muscle mass reconstitution did not correlate with resolution of the weakness. So maybe the muscle mass is more or less again the same as pre as before going to the ICU, but muscle weakness still persists in these patients with all the consequences in their daily life activity. What I think that we need is more studies where COPD can be assessed in this type of, uh, of, 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 uh, of uh, approaches and see whether the COPD itself may influence negatively all these uh, traits in the skeletal muscles. Also in the same paper, they analyze satellite cells. Satellite cells are very important because it's the mechanism that muscles, our muscles use for regeneration when we have an injury. And what they concluded from this study is, was that in the quadriceps muscle, satellite cells remained lower in patients with persistent muscle atrophy after ICU discharge. So this means that the capacity to regenerate is decreased in these muscles after this period, this critical illness, this period of critical illness in the patients. So and as a summary of these uh, mechanisms is that muscle weakness is uh, implied in the poor prognosis and of course it has implications on the quality of life of these patients. Muscle fiber atrophy exists in all sorts of muscles that have been analyzed so far, the quadriceps, diaphragm, rectus femoris. Sarcomere disruption is also present, higher protein breakdown and degradation, enhanced proteolysis, autophagy, greater inflammation levels, and reduced, and this is for me the most important uh, mechanism, is that there, there is a reduced potential of muscle regeneration in these patients. So the way I see things that we need to study, um, we need to conduct more papers in which the role of COPD on all these mechanisms needs to be explored and needs to be uh, studied per se. And I think that was my last slide, and I would like to thank you again for your uh, kind invitation to participate in this satellite symposium. And I hope that uh, you have understood something, although I had to speak very quickly. And of course, I will be uh, able to answer any questions that people may have. Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Dr. Barreiro, for your outstanding uh, uh, conference. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce the Dr. Federico Gordo Vidal for Spain. He works in the intensive care unit for Hospital Universitario Henares in Spain. He, he has skills and expertise in critical care medicine, mechanical ventilation, airway management, uh, resuscitation, emerg emergency area, intensive care medicine, sepsis, and ventilation. And he presents the conference uh, with, the, with the title uh, electric impedance tomography to determine optimal positive and inspiratory pressure is speed in COPD patient. Dr. Gordo, you have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. Eh, muchas gracias por la presentación. Eh, como sé que se va a traducir y hay muchos más... And I know eh, for the introduction and I know that this conference is going to be translated into English. I'd rather speak Spanish knowing that it's going to be interpreted in English. Yes, we're going to talk about electrical impedance tomography to determine optimal positive and expiratory pressure in severe chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. When I was invited to talk about this, I was really happy, but I think that uh, this was like a bear trap because this is rather difficult to talk about because we need to talk about this uh, issue from a very practical point of view, but we don't really have very much uh, a, a, a big amount of evidence available. But we do have a long clinical practice. Here you can see an example of a patient with a, a COPD and she had an infection together with the COPD uh, situation. When she was treated with the um, tomography to chi achieve uh, homogeneous ventilation and to get uh, complete depleteness of the lung, we needed to use uh, PP levels that were outstanding uh, some time ago. What do we think that this tomography can um, can um, really give us, as you see in this active image, you see how we can value the heterogeneity of the depletedness of the lung. Uh, we see the lung depleting at different times and we can also value and assess, monitor the time constant. 
We also know that the constant of time depends on the resistance, but not of the global action of the respiratory m mechanism. We also are able to see something we've been talked about as the pendle luft phenom phenomenon. We can see the movement of the air in different regions without the lung being depleted. Here we can also see another uh, utility. We see collapse areas that can very easily recover or rescue with distress. <coughs> On your right, you can also see how we can measure objectively the time constant in different areas. In the upper part, you can see the global time constant, and in the lower areas, the different pulmonary re regions, so we can estimate different effects. The um, ETI has been incorporated in our protocol in the ICU. We always search maximum clo uh, openness and minimize distension and a homogeneous uh, distribution of ventilation. And we apply this not to just uh, patients under distress, but to all of them. This is what we've achieved so far. So it really helps us a lot. Uh, in maximizing to uh, identify uh, heterogeneous uh, dysfunctions, we are also uh, able to avoid distension and we are able to identify what happens during also the outtake of air. Why do we think so? Because we always talk about distress in our previous panel. We're talking about a very important pathology this morning. I'm sure you talked about the impedance tomography in distress, but m in most of our patients, uh, they are not under distress. They uh, have regular lungs. Uh, they are post-surgery uh, sur patients or uh, bilateral uh, patients. But what is the uh, ETI? For you who don't know this technique, it's a non-invasive technique. We use a belt under the chest of the patient, and we can use it in different patients. And we send electrical signals that are ca uh, caught, and we use a tomographic image of the distribution of uh, ventilation. We are able to see different formats. Here is the COSTA method to estimate right now how to ventilate patients under distress. And here you can see the tests to uh, COPD, uh, patients with res residual uh, and pulmonar um, recruitment levels. This is how we are more or less trying to do. We're trying to improve our ventilation. Not just that, but we are also to carry out regional, absolutely cre regional analysis. You see the yellow area shows a retardment in the uh, openness. There, this is a cyclic open and closing area of the, of the uh, lung. So this is a potentially recruitable area with a very fast uh, close uh, function. How about COPD? These recently published uh, graphs show uh, a concept that very uh, uh, most of us know or should know. Not just the PEP levels, but also how to work with uh, hidden PEP. There are bronchial closures, closings that lead to auto PEP that we are not able to measure because the system's not connected. There are areas in the lung where air is being caught that we are not able to estimate. And you, we know that the severity of COPD uh, has to do with this trapped volume. We're not able to measure this uh, trapped volume. We need to find other ways to, to measure it. Maybe professionals very used to use these uh, the T uh, ETI can use um, different methods. You can see a couple of cases of lower PEEP and how the uh, uh, plateau pressure also goes down. Whereas on the right side, you can see a PEEP lowering, lowering levels, but no uh, effect on the uh, plateau pressure. So the adjustment should be done differently. If, you, if we don't do that correctly, 
and we have a, a patient with spontaneous ventilation or breathing, we will have a higher effort of uh, inspiration. We would see hemodynamical um, dysfunction, and we need to find a way to solve it. Fortunately, this year has been published, not just by myself, but by other, of course, other professionals, uh, assessing um, the uh, regional respiratory time constant. So, as you can see here, they carry out this assessment, they analyze the constant of time globally, and then in different sections of the, of the lung, we can then study the area that we want to target. Here on the upper side, you can see a distress situation. We can see the time constant that uh, practically even though the, po the, the lung is uh, very homogeneous, but the, 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 the truth is that the stress is very homogeneous. Here you can see a more bilateral uh, distress, and on the last side is what we have in the COPD patients. We see a retardment, and that is why it's shown in red in the constant time, and you can see how it is completely heterogeneous. There is a huge difference uh, among different regions in the lung. The, um, see the, the, the uh, behavior of alveoles is completely different. Here you can see in PEEP, there are collapsed areas that we are not able to study, areas with very fast uh, time constant. Here you, you see COPD and pneumonia patient. Here you can see a very heterogeneous distribution. And then severe o COPD patients where you see areas with high heterogeneous heterogeneity levels. What happens when we add PP? Uh, strategy, you see what happens in severe COPD when we alter, we vary the PP. We can look for a more suited PEEP level to adjust to the uh, uh, patient. We are able to achieve complete depleteness of the lung and uh, try to find the best, hom most homogeneous ventilation. Another study also published very recently where the um, lung response to, to bronchodilator and, and see what the response is. Just to finish, I just want to show you what we're doing right now and I wanted to tell you about the data recently published and in, in a Congress that we're going to try to publish uh, in the future. We analyzed 16 uh, non-distress um, patients and some of them with COPD and we adjusted the PEEP level done by their physician through a pulmonary uh, recruitment um, strategy and an and adjustment of PEEP to the better to the best compliance at the regional level. As expected, with this PEEP adjustment, we've been able to improve compliance of of uh, patients and the tidal volume too, in order to then reassure, pr uh, reduce the pressure of uh, the um, pressure um, driving pressure. But then when we separate the, um, the data, we see differences because the uh, PEEP was modified in 13 out of 16 patients when we were using the ETI. In many, ch in many cases, we, we were creating an uh, upsurge of PEEP, but in others, there was a reduction of it. So we are trying to exactly uh, try to avoid hyperdistension we are able to adjust PEEP and reduce the, um, driving, the driving pressure too. We also see changes in the different regions of the lung with the ETI. Nowadays we are using it not uh, in 100% of patients, but we use it with all the complex patients and many of them where we are not sure about how to improve their ventilation. And we, we think these are the benefits. What we think are the benefits is uh, particularly personalize the uh, ventilation and make it more homogeneous and also improving the uh, constant time and pulmonary depletion in patients with COPD. I'm, I'm sorry I'm not able to show New England tests, but this is so far the evidence we've been able to gather. Thank you so much. University of Denmark is professor in respiratory medicine, consultant of the Department of Respiratory Disease and Allergology, advisor in allergology, he is board member of the World Allergy Organization.
with the uh, issue of the COPD treatment paradigm, evidence for recent studies. You have 15 minutes, Dr. Dow. Uh, with less than 100 millimeters in movement, 
We see that in fact they start having a clinical significant improvement in everyone when people eat two drugs together. This is what we call maximum organization today with one drug for therapies, and it is something of a very big move forward in the treatment of COPD. We see here in a meta analysis of the food sample of 23,000 patients that the more we can wrong it the patients, the more we can reduce the exacerbation rate. So there is this close association between the degree of wrong gradation and the reduction in exacerbation rate. Now, this is not associated with an increased adverse event rate, so there is no mortality, serious adverse events or cardiac serious adverse events are not increased uh, by the dual wrong gradators compared to the more components. Now we have this uh, very important study uh, that's just uh, been published this year. It's a very large study. You see there about more than 10,000 uh, single patients included. Now these patients, they have all a uh, highly symptomatic uh, presentation and they all have uh, uh, one or more exacerbations in the past year. So they have their chronic medicine at the end, they are uh, randomized to have in steroid, the lava, lava, the triple combination in one inhaler. In the same inhaler, another group have the in steroid and the non piece agonist, and the third group have the maximum correlation with the lava lava. So here we can test how these drugs perform and compare the outcome of this. What you see here is that uh, the patients, they are usual, simply uh, patient, about say, five years of age, more males than females, uh, still third of them are still smoking, and their uh, airways obstruction and not function is a little bit below 50% of their predicted normal value. So, about 70 percent of them, they had two, one or one severe. One severe means they had been to the hospital with an exacerbation. Well, and they all had an exacerbation. For 30 percent, they had only one moderate exacerbation. Now, here's you see the, 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 uh, the outcome, which is very, very important because uh, we used to think that the maximum population is uh, the major uh, drug and major intervention that would be the best outcome. But what we see from this large study that you so uh, profound on the results is that when we compare the uh, inexperienced long activities agonists, this is just like Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, is this one called? We see that adding the lama in the triple combination gives a 50% reduction in exacerbation rate. But if we compare this exacerbation rate with the exacerbation rate during the, uh, the uh, dual propagator, we see a 25% reduction. And as I told you, we know that the more population we give, the more we can reduce exacerbation rate. But uh, that adding in the medical is very important in this group of patients of accessibility, C group group D. Looking at uh, those uh, outcomes, that is, the patients that go to hospital with severe worsening, we see that the, drug, the, the medication that contain in it or the triple combination, is a little better, not significantly so, compared to the inexcusable non-active examples. But look, there's a 34 percent reduction when you compare the triple therapy with the maximum population with the lower A very, very important outcome for 
Do you have any question or comment about the panel? Yes, I have one question for Dr. Gordo. Can you hear me? Yes, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for your talk. Especially, I wanted to talk to you about electrical impedance tomography. In your experience, um, with regard to the PEEP level, have you had other benefits with regard to um, proper outcomes depending on the mechanical ventilations? We still haven't had time to analyze this. The use and the utility of electrical impedance tomography is being used for distressed patients to evaluate collapse and recruitment techniques as well as distension. The interest that we have with regard to these patients with uh, COPD is very recent. Up until now, there was hardly any literature. But now we have new software tools to monitor, uh, monitor it in real time. So we're starting to work on that regard. For the patients that we use, is the same as for distress, not just to adjust the time uh, values, but also to recruit pulmonary uh, recruitment to see what is the uh, value of uh, PEEP and uh, support at different levels. The clinical use is very obvious. Now we need to research so that we uh, um, can have it widespread. Muchas gracias por su respuesta. Dr. Ordoña, do you have any other question? I do. In patients with uh, COPD exacerbation, we know that non-invasive technique is uh, fundamental because it decreases mortality rate. However, there is more and more um, evidence of this um, new technique uh, for this uh, new device. How do they work with uh, COPD? Very recently, Gustavo Pelotocnic in Argentina, in Argentina, sorry, published some um, studies using this type of technology, and in France too, we use it too with COPD patients. It's very interesting because we can assess not just response to oxygenation but the opening of the lungs, and in some patients we are doing that with high flux uh, nasal tubes. 
But so far, the best treatment for these patients is non-invasive ventilation, which is helping them. Um, we reduce the number of uh, ICU patients, lower mortality rate, and um, for weaning, this is very important uh, with this uh, nasal cannula. That's how we are using it. And the uh, CO2 cleaning is also very important, especially when we're talking about residual function, uh, especially mm, the same with uh, non-invasive techniques. La experiencia mexicana también ha comenzado. Tenemos ahora mismo más de 200 pacientes con EPOC en mi eh, paciente, en mi hospital, perdón. Uh, but my, our recommendation is begin, begin in your hospitals because it's very comfort for the patients if the experience in the gasometry is very good. I don't know the experience in Colombia or in, or in another parts of, of Europe, but here in, in Mexico City, we have a good results. Uh, Dr. Fernandez uh, for Spain, do you have a, a some question or comments? Oh, yes, of course. Thank you for your invitation. Uh, I have a couple of points to comment with Dr. Barreiro. In terms of uh, muscle weakness, uh, and not to be very pessimistic, we know it's a, a very bad situation for our patients, but how, how do you have any information about how can we improve this muscle weakness in the acute phase, not after months and months of repeating? And another possibility to, to, to get some some useful for next for that is uh, can you believe that the the very bad muscle condition when they arrive to the ICU can be a prognostic factor to an, to anticipate that non-invasive ventilation can fail? Dr. Barreiro, you are there. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. No? yes. Yes? Yes. So I was saying that thank you very much uh, to Dr. Rafael Fernandez for uh, his uh, two questions. Uh, well, I think that uh, the only thing we can do actually, and what are in several ICU uh, settings are doing already, is that to start uh, doing rehab to these patients very early on. As soon as they get to the ICU, Although I know this is very complicated and very expensive because you need a lot of uh, human resources, basically, but I've seen some video clips, for example, from the people in Chicago, where they have shown that the patients are walking, actually. They are really walking, it's fascinating. You, you can see the patients walking there in the middle of the corridors with the mechanical ventilation, and of course, a huge number of people trying to help them because they are, of course, they are, uh, they are not awake. Uh, and uh, so it's something that uh, I think is the only thing we can do so far, not only for ICU, for any condition where you have muscle loss, the only thing that is helping us to replace or to, in, in a way to compensate for the muscle loss is exercise. This is something that we know for sure. We haven't found a drug that you can take and then just you know, magically you, you recover all your muscle mass. So the only thing we can do is exercise and the exercise must be uh, initiated as soon as possible. Because if you just leave the patient for many, many days and they start losing a lot of muscle mass, then as shown uh, by the group in, in, in the different countries, but especially the group in, in Toronto, what happens is that you, the capacity of mm, the muscles to regenerate is very low, is diminished. And especially with aging, I haven't mentioned that, but COPD patients and aging and all these kind of factors, of course, they are influencing very negatively uh, the potential to, for the muscles to regenerate. This is one thing. And the other second question, uh, can you please repeat it again? Uh, your second yeah, question? I mean, because it's, it's, uh, muscle weakness is related to bad outcome can be a, a marker of early failure of non-invasive ventilation and to go to invasive ventilation? I think that it could be used as a marker. Of course, I'm not a, an intensivist. I don't work in the ICU, so I, have no, I don't have the experience. But uh, for me, it sounds as a very important pronostic marker 
that should be actually, uh, it's very easy uh, to, to measure the muscle, well, the body composition is not very difficult to do that. And uh, it's something that you can, you can use uh, at least, if it's not a marker, at least a parameter to give, have, give you an idea or about how this patient is going to uh, behave probably from, uh, from, from, from the very first day that the patient is, is being, uh, I mean, hospitalized in the ICU. There is an, another interesting paper that was published just a couple of weeks ago in CHEST by a group in, um, in uh, New York area. And they have shown actually very nicely, they measured the amount of muscle that the patients have at the time of being in the ICU. And they have studied those patients for several years and they have established a model, a predictive model of uh, how these patients evolve and progress according to the muscle mass that they already had at the time of being uh, sent to the ICU. So it's the amount of muscle that you have in your body when you get to when you reach the level of the critical illness, which is actually we're going to predict, to help you predict what, the, I mean, the evolution of this patient. So it's something that's very, very interesting and it's really fascinating. I mean, it's, uh, your body composition is going, to, is going to say a lot of things. I mean, regardless of the underlying condition, whether they have COPD, these patients had COPD, most of them, but they, may, they also had infections, they had other things. And what they found was, and this is published in CHEST uh, just a couple of weeks ago because one of the, uh, the authors is a friend of mine and he sent me a copy of uh, the, uh, the, the accepted paper. He was very happy. And I think that it's going to have a, a lot of clinical implications. These, uh, these results have a, a lot of clinical implications. So it should, uh, my answer is yes. We should measure the body composition. We should measure the amount of muscle mass in these patients. And of course, this may help predict uh, outcomes and of course, uh, the outcome of mechanical ventilation as well. We have a short question for Dr. Gordo. Yeah, okay. Uh, Pede, uh, for those people that is the vast majority that doesn't have uh, tomography, can we other can we use other surrogates like uh, mm, expiratory curve in the ventilator, uh, dead space uh, emptying? Uh, what uh, try to help the the vast majority of physician that doesn't have uh, this. Uh, fantastic technology. Well, uh, Rafa, thank you for your question, but I think that um, you can use a plateau pressure like the better estimate of the level of PIP in these patients because you must uh, uh, to have account the uh, occult PIP. This is the most important question in this kind of patients, I think. I have a question. I'm Pablo from Madrid. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. This this question is for Dr. Dajal. Ronald, well, the results you mentioned are really strong. I guess we have to mix, to combine different drugs. But almost all these kind of results are related to chronic patients chronic COPD patient. How can we translate this really important and relevant result from chronic patient to acute patient? For example, when we have a severe COPD exacerbation and we have to intubate the patient and so on. Do you think we have to combine three drugs, for example? How can we deal with these kind of problems? Yeah, well, I, I honestly think that, uh, and you do it both uh, in the uh, intensive care unit and in the hospital departments, you nebulize or inhale the uh, combination of the beta agonist and uh, the anticholinergic drug. So, uh, and you, we, we do that in, and you give them in very big amounts and big dosages to assure that uh, we get the maximum response because in exacerbation uh, more than normal doses are needed to get uh, the, the maximum responses we know. So yes, uh, that, that is used and you can of course uh, have in the ventilator uh, give uh, the net ice medication.
to the Jew. I would like to comment also that it is possible nowadays because, uh, to uh, influence muscle mass by pharmacological intervention. And uh, that is both by decreasing the catabolism that we have biologicals that do that, and to in, uh, increase uh, muscle generation by uh, anabolic steroid and SARMs, as it is called today. So other drugs will reduce the oxidative uh, metabolism uh, that, uh, that uh, increases catabolism. So we have different ways today uh, that uh, have shown really good results uh, in, in, in uh, serine patients in their muscle mass. And we should learn from the doping, from, uh, from uh, the sports people. Uh, they they can, can enhance muscle. Performance. Thank you for all the experts. We are on time. Thank you for this uh, outstanding session. And uh, thank you for Pablo. Thank you, Dr. Fernandez. Thank you for Ordonez in, in Colombia, here in Mexico, Daniel Avila. Thank you for all the support. The Latin American Association of Thorax invite you the next year in Panama for our Congress in Latin America 2019. Thank you for all the panelists. Uh, goodbye for Mexico City and good night for Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. The European Respiratory Society. I'd like to, be, to wish you every success with your meeting. Respiratory disease is something that affects millions of people worldwide and taking care of these patients, especially in circumstances of emergency and critical care, is extremely important. There are many patients, there's a lot of suffering, we should be able to prevent it and alleviate it. The European Society is the largest respiratory society. We're European-based, but we have members in 162 countries. Um, over 32,000 members, and we all try to do our best for our patients. So we promote science, we promote education for our members, but also education and information for our patients, and advocacy. So we work with policymakers to make sure that everything, easy access to care, early diagnosis, and best care is available for our patients. With this in mind, I'd like to wish you every success to your meeting. Everything we do in respiratory medicine is important and it has an effect on patients. And I would also like to invite you to our meeting in Paris this coming September. Every success to your meeting. Do more. Feel better. <laughs> Live longer. At GSK, we have a very special purpose, but we live in a challenging and uncertain world where even more is expected of us. We're on the brink of a seismic shift in the world's age population. Troubling news over rising costs and their impact on patients. Our opportunity has never been greater. Science and technology is rapidly transforming our understanding of disease, and there is ever more demand for innovation. to become one of the world's most innovative, best performing, and trusted healthcare companies, we must respond. So let's take on this unique challenge together to change the world for the better. By having the courage to push the boundaries of research, harnessing our breakthrough science, to bring needed quality healthcare products to more people. Partnering with those who share our values to go even further. And most importantly, being in touch with society so people trust both our science and our intentions. Together, Let's challenge ourselves today to change people's lives tomorrow.